Good morning, everybody. I'm John O'Loughlin. Welcome to my channel. It's called McDuff Lives Too. And uh, we're um, there's it's Tuesday morning. Um, every other Tuesday, we've had the great pleasure of, of having Harley Schlanger of the LaRouche organization come and join us with an update. And uh, this is no exception. We're so glad to have Harley back. And uh, so welcome to the show, Harley Schlanger. How are you today? Thank you, John. I'm trying to keep my head from spinning as these developments just keep pouring in. Yeah, I, I, it's been a very busy week for everybody. Uh, of course, you know, here at, uh, at uh, McDuff Household, we've been dealing with some interesting uh, health issues, which we're uh, just want to let everybody know things are going fine. Um, drummer or my, my wife, Marcia, she's uh, recovering from her, her uh, heart attack event. And uh you know we're we're adjusting and things are going to things are going to be fine so thanks so much for your concern and and your thoughts and prayers um harley slanger uh your show this morning has a lot to do with uh the economy of europe and uh what could happen uh with this so-called green new deal if if we don't make some changes and it sounds sounds pretty uh uh, dramatic, if and uh, probably some more adjectives that I can't think of right now that are bad. It's just, it's just, it looks like a a a, a doomsday scenario. Um, is that is that going too far? Well, I, I, it's not doomsday because it can be changed, and there's a, a growing tendency in people to say, why are we going down this road? But the road we've been going down in Europe, and it's not so different in the U.S. with the Green New Deal, it's just that in the U.S. you have a little bit more of a, a brakes being applied to it. But in Germany, for example, they've already agreed to have a nuclear exit. This was the reaction to the Fukushima reactor, what, eight, ten years ago, which had nothing to do with anything in Germany. But they concluded that they had to shut down all nuclear reactors in Germany, which was producing more than a quarter of the electricity. Uh, that exit ends, uh, or next year, they're going to end nuclear power in Germany. They're now talking about an exit from coal. So what's happening in Germany? Utility prices are skyrocketing. And my, my personal bill here, my since I've lived here now for four years, uh, it's doubled mm. in four years. And so far in the first eight months of 2021, it's gone up 14%. So that's a pretty steep increase in, in costs. Uh, the, at, at the same time, there are warnings that there will be power outages this winter. Uh, the Polish government warned the German government that they may not be able to provide excess electricity to Germany when Germany needs it. And you know, the problem in Germany is the, to the extent you become more and more dependent on wind and solar, you're more and more dependent on windy weather and sun and i can tell you in north germany the sun doesn't shine that much in the winter so there have already been moments where they've had to bring in electricity from uh, poland from austria from the czech republic you know you think about it germany's one of the technological marvels or it was considered that for many many years and it's dependent now on polish coal and czech coal for its electricity and austrian hydroelectric so quite a, a come down. Now, in, in the United Kingdom, prices of every aspect of electricity are skyrocketing. Uh, and out of the what they did in, in England is they followed the or Great Britain, they followed the California Enron model of deregulating electricity so that supposedly the competition would lower prices. So you have 55 companies in Great Britain that provide electricity. Now, most of them, in order to provide lower rates, don't do maintenance, just like the California and Texas plants. Don't do maintenance, don't do upgrades, don't modernize. Um, and, and as a result, you have rolling blackouts, you have uh, overloads. And now because of the cost, the increased cost of natural gas and, and uh, uh, oil and coal, uh, five or six companies in England of the 55 went bankrupt since August 1st, and they're projecting that only six to 10 of them will remain by the middle of next year. And so Boris Johnson called his cabinet together today to, or yesterday, to have a, an emergency session. And he said, look, we've got to fix this. 
So what does Johnson do? During the meeting, he takes off for the United States to co-chair a panel on global warming at the United Nations today. So he's going to try to do to the rest of the world what's been done to Great Britain. And he said his main concern is going to be to try to browbeat China into accepting the Green New Deal. So the people can go to the, uh, the LaRoucheOrganization.com and, and look at my daily update for today because I gave some more details. Uh, but this is where the United States is headed. This is where uh, Europe is headed. Who's not headed in this direction? China, Russia, India, uh, Ghana. Ghana is going with a very aggressive nuclear power development. Uh, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, they're all going with, not with uh, so-called sustainable, but with what? nuclear and coal. Sorry. So in, in any case, that's, that's what I was covering this morning, uh, the, the craziness of the Green New Deal and the Great Reset. Yeah, sorry, I just got a, a cue from, from Drummer over there, but we're good. Um, the Green New Deal is uh, described in a booklet that you that the Schiller Institute published uh, called the, I'm sorry, I have it at hand here, but I wanted to show Great it. Great Leap Backward. The Great Leap Backward, right. And we and we had four shows from the, uh, from the authors of those uh, essays yeah. uh, here on my, on my uh, channel. And I'll be replaying those shows on on my uh, Screaming Ospreys TV channel in the near future. So, a lot okay. of the a lot of the great stuff we've been doing is is going to be kind of a repertory that just going to go after it one after another. There you go, Andy pulled it up for us. So, uh, folks, get a copy of this book if you haven't. I think it's twenty bucks, uh, and it's it's something that you can share with other people. I mean, it's not just for you; it's for uh, letting other people. You know, people look at you funny. They say, you know, are you you know, like I, I say, you know, windmills are not the answer. Well, a lot of people think windmills are the answer. Well, where does it go from there? Well, if you hand them a copy of this book, then you've got some text, you've got some some uh, references and things to talk about. And that's the value of, of, of you know, the printed word. People really do uh, uh, put more into something that they read if you hand it to them and if you just tell it to them. Uh, I find it very frustrating to try to talk to my friends about these things and without having uh, something to back it up. Um, so at least if I if I can show them, look at this book. You know, look at this. It's you know, it's not it's not even a book. It's a little booklet, but it's got about ten really great essays in it that'll that'll help you convince your friends that uh, we really are on the right track here uh, with with us uh, attacking the the, uh, the the Green New Deal, attacking the Great Reset. And attacking the idea of climate change itself, which is one of the things that, that I think the Schiller Institute has done a great job of exposing the fraud of climate change itself. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit, Harley? Well, I, I'll mention that there's an ongoing series in Italy of real climatologists, real space scientists who are having biweekly sessions or every other week a session to challenge the, the precepts of the Green New Deal. The idea that it's carbon dioxide, which is causing global warming, that it's man's uh, farming and man's development of combustion engines and, and factories, that that's the cause of global warming. So a group of scientists, uh, many of whom were not allowed to publish in major newspapers because the line is the, the debate is settled, the science is settled, but it's not. In fact, most of the so-called science is coming from journalists, not from actual scientists. Uh, people like Dr. William Happer from Princeton, who made the point that 99% of our climate comes from the sun and solar radiation and solar cycles and has very little to do with human activity. And he points out the obvious that there were uh, periods of warming and periods of cooling long before the first combustion engine ever came out onto the earth. So in Italy, they're having these debates and they've invited these supporters of the Green New Deal come and let's have an open discussion. Let's have a debate. Let's let's get this out in the open. Not a single one has the guts to show up. And so at universities, especially in northern Italy, by the way, they've had blackouts in Milan recently. Milan's another case. Northern Italy is quite industrialized, and to have blackouts in Milan is a real scandal. 
So at the one, of, I think the technical university in uh, Florence the other day, they had a couple hundred people there and they were demanding, why are there no people to take the other side? And the professor said, we invited them, go ask them next time to come. And so some of the students went out and, and got some of the loudest mouths supporting the, the climate theory and said, look, come to this event. We need you to, to represent us. And they said, no, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to give credibility to the other side. So this is a form of cancel culture or, or censorship. And that's why what, what we're doing is so crucial, because we're giving scientists the opportunity to actually present science including the other side. If, if someone wants to argue about how CO2 is a poison, they're welcome to come to these debates, but it's so preposterous. Now you have the, the, the most recent thing, Bill Gates came out and said that we have to get rid of methane gases. And actually Biden had a, a, a panel discussion. They have a, a new methane policy. Now, where does methane come from? comes mostly from grazing animals and the gas they let off as a result of breaking down the grasses that they eat. Well, here's the argument. Gates is saying we have to give up animal protein. We have to give up beef. And you know, pretty soon they're going to say you have to give up flour because wheat requires certain things that come from the, the drain, the nutrients from the soil. So what we're, what we're seeing is what we at the Schiller Institute have long uh, argued that the people who are saying these things have a commitment, an ideological commitment to population reduction. They want us to go back to the Middle Ages in terms of the amount of energy we consume, the amount of uh, energy that goes into the food supply and, and so on. This is insane. It's a new dark age. And to not debate it, but to, to just ram it through based on narratives and media, uh, emotional, hysterical appeals. You know, my, I have two children in the public schools in Potsdam. And the candidate for Green Party for Chancellor, Annalena Baerbach, is from Potsdam. Uh, her qualifications are she was a former champion gymnast in Germany, and she has a degree from the London School of Economics, not surprisingly. And... Everyone says that she should be elected because she's young and she's green. Now, when she gets into debates, she doesn't know what to say. She was challenged by a retiree who said, if you continue with these windmills and solar on my pension, I won't be able to afford to heat my house. What do you say to people like me? And she said, well, you have to think about your grandchildren and the future. And she said, I'm thinking of the future. I'm thinking of my next month electricity bill. And Baerbach had nothing she could say, but they're rigging the election. So you have a, what's called a red green alliance, the social Democrats and the greens. And just this last week, the two leading German industrial associations, the manufacturing and, and producers uh, issued a very strong call for a return to nuclear. Uh, the government of Belgium told the Germans don't give up nuclear power because you're not going to have enough electricity. So, you know, and then at this UN climate conference coming up in, in November, the uh, COP26, they're terribly upset because the Chinese, the Indians, the Russians, and others are saying, all right, we accept that, that you're worried about climate change, so you do something about it, but we want to develop. We have a development model. And the scientists from India, China, and Russia are saying, our scientists say this development model is not going to heat up the planet. So, you know, it's a, it's a fight that can be won because th this is directly connected. The Green New Deal is directly connected to the Great Reset in the following way. The leading global bankers, such as Mark Carney, former head of the Bank of England, such as the people at BlackRock and, and uh, uh, Bank of America, have agreed to what they call a compact, a green compact, that banks will stop lending to any company that has a carbon footprint. By 2030, if you produce something of metals or construction or transportation that has a carbon footprint, you'll be denied credit. That's the real force 
enforcement mechanism behind the Green New Deal. Now, is that going to be accepted? Well, the Federal Reserve just set up a, a whole green panel to look into how to do that. Uh, Mark Carney has 130 banks and financial institutions that signed this compact, committing themselves to not lending to any company that produces something. Because look, aluminum, steel, construction, transportation, uh, all of these things require material that produces carbon, carbon dioxide. So the question is, if you're going to stop all of that, what are you going to do, build ro roads out of toothpicks? Now, the other thing, John, and this is something that, that most environmentalists never think about. If you deny poor countries coal-powered electricity or nuclear-powered electricity or any even fossil fuels of various sorts, natural gas and so on, what are they going to do to, to heat their homes? They're going to chop down forests. That's the worst thing you can do. We need more trees. Trees love carbon dioxide, but you're creating a situation where poorer countries are going to denude their territory of trees in order to stay warm in the winter. So the, the whole thing is, is absolutely backwards. And that's why we put out the pamphlet. And I think if people are, want to get the full story, much more than, than I can give you, uh, we have, I think it's about eight or eight or so authors who put this report together. So I would encourage people just go to the LaRouche organization, uh, dot com website and type in great leap backward in the search engine. And they'll tell you how to get the pamphlet. And there are sections of it, which we make available for free online. Yes. And there's a lot of great stuff at Schiller Institute, uh, dot com as well as LaRouche, um, LaRouche org. Dot com, And I always reference uh, the, the Roosh, um, pub dot com, which is just a tremendous resource for uh, for archived material from the Schiller folks going back uh, maybe 40 years or so now. And it's uh, it's just I, I have I can't tell you how much joy I've had just discovering article after article after article in, in the executive intelligence review that just stimulates me and and makes me feel like doing more work and more research and, and tying things together uh, that I didn't think I could tie together, but uh, here it comes. It's a, it's, it's a great uh, bunch of, of uh, researchers and writers that uh, I'm so glad to have, a, have discovered and uh, hopefully uh, make a little contribution here and there to, uh, to their great work. Um, now, and, John, if, if we can, I'd, I'd like to shift over to the geostrategic situation for a second, because I, I just wrote a short piece that points out the paradoxes in present U.S. policy uh, using the situation uh, involving the Afghan withdrawal, uh, the General Milley controversy, and then this AUKUS, the Australia-UK-US new secret deal that was, was uh, done behind the backs of the French and our, our allies. Because what they show is there's tremendous disagreement and conflict, even within the deep state, as to where to go. Now, they all have a general agreement that we need to have a military buildup. We need to target so-called enemy states, such as Russia and China, uh, and that we need to support the Green New Deal and the Great Reset. But how to do it? is the conflict. And so I picked on a couple of these things, starting with uh, the General Milley story. You know, as Woodward tells it, Milley was calling the Chinese because he thought Trump was crazy enough to launch a nuclear strike if he lost the election. And then he called them back after January 6th to say, don't worry, I'm in control here. Basically an Al Haig story. <laughs> I'm in control here. We're not going to let Trump use the nuclear weapons. We're going to override it. Now, there's so many things wrong with that. First of all, we don't know for certain what he actually said, because it's Bob Woodward, who often plays fast and loose with the way he puts quotes together. He may have tapes where he has all these things on it, but it may be out of context or so on. So we don't know for sure what Milley was saying. But if he's saying that he went behind Trump's back because he thought Trump was a madman and was about to blow up the world, that's that breaks the the chain of command 
it, it goes against the his authority as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And whether whether it's treasonable or not is another question because he didn't do it. But talking about it should get him fired. Now, the other side of the story is maybe what he later said as an explanation is true, that he wants to have more consultation with the Chinese so we avoid war by mistake. Much more clear on this was his vice chair, John Hyten, General John Hyten, who said, we need to be talking to more Chinese officials on the, the military defense level uh, because we need to have clarity of what we're doing and what they're doing. But, and Hyten said, we must never have a war against Russia or China. Now, that's not quite what you get from what Milley was saying, uh, because what Milley at the same time, he's saying this thing about how he's trying to avoid war, he was one of the people who was undermining President Trump's attempts to pull troops out of Afghanistan and Syria. And after Biden withdrew the troops, Milley said that we'll probably have to go back in there again, backing up Lindsey Graham on that. So what's the actual policy? I think there's a split in the military. Uh, it also raises the question, since Joe Biden probably didn't make the final decision on his own, was the botched withdrawal from Afghanistan due to some of these military types who deliberately botched it uh, to undercut Biden and to undercut the idea of withdrawing from these wars. So if you just take that as a, a kind of uh, subset of, of US foreign policy, what you see is the incoherence. Now, then add to it Biden having a, a online get together with Boris Johnson and uh, the Australian prime minister, whose, whose name is escaping me for the moment, Boris. Uh, where they announced that they made an agreement to provide nuclear submarines to Australia, which meant that the Australians were canceling a contract they had with the French over a period of, of at least six years. Turns out now that it was an 18 month negotiation between Australia and the United States and Britain. It was never leaked, never got out into the open. So they did it secretly. And then they, they had the gall to say, well, this isn't aimed at anybody. Uh, the Chinese said immediately, of course it is, it's aimed at China. But it then goes back to the Afghan question. Remember what Biden said when he pulled out the troops, we're ending the era of these, these wars, these endless wars. Now, does he really mean that? Or are we building up for a possible war in the Indo-Pacific with China? So again, the, the absolute incoherence of US policy has much of the world scratching its head and maybe some of the world heading into bunkers. So I, I think this is something that, that we really have to look at. And instead of just saying Biden's senile, Trump's crazy, or Trump was right about everything, or you know the, the kinds of profiles that people have, we've really got to get deeper into this question of who's benefiting from all of this. And I'll give you a simple answer to that. I'm sure you already know. British intelligence, the city of London, because it looked for a moment when Biden withdrew the troops that the British were left out. Boris Johnson tried to call him for 18 hours before he finally reached him to find out what was going on. There, there were epitaphs for the so-called global Britain in all the British newspapers. And then one week later, it's all hail Britannia, Britain's back in the game. And how did they get back in the game? They negotiated with the Australians. It was first the British and the Australians who then came to the United States and said, here's a, a better deal for you to sell nuclear subs to Australia. Now, Australia has no nuclear technical backup. So it means that they're gonna to have to depend entirely on US technicians and science and know-how. So the opposition leader in Australia said, this is turning Australia into an aircraft carrier for the United States. And the Chinese actually said, no, it turns Australia into collateral damage if there's a war. So I, I just thought I'd throw these things out. I know it's complex and it's quite convoluted, but it really shows 
that we're in uncharted waters when it comes to where we're headed and why it's so dangerous and why people really have to develop a capacity to think strategically to make decisions as opposed to the old profiles of left versus right, socialist versus uh, conservative, uh, identity politics and, and so on. All of that is designed to cause people to grab, make emotional decisions based on profiles rather than actual thoughtful creative discoveries. I, I'm delighted to get into to, uh, some depth on the Australia situation, which is, is frightens me also because of the severity of their lockdowns and the way that that, that is destroying people's lives over, over the, the uh, uh, the uh, pandemic that cannot be named, and 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 it's uh, it, it looks like a totalitarian uh, nightmare descending upon the people of of Oz, with and and I've I've been watching it you know through my readings I the book the crimes crimes of patriots by Jonathan Quitney K W yeah. yeah yeah that is one of you know, I've got even got it right here. I, I did a one-hour review of the book. It's on my channel. Um, Crimes of Patriots, A True Tale of Dope, Dirty Money, and the CIA, uh, published in the 80s. And uh, the gentleman died not too long after that. But the, 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 what, what you learn is that the CIA was running its dope money out of the Golden Triangle into a bank. Well, it, it started, you know, and Harley, Harley knows this better than I do, but, but it starts with the Hellowell uh, during the war uh, financing uh, the OSS uh, Detachment 101 flying the hump up to uh, um, uh, Chung King, as it was called, mm -hmm. and, and working with the, with the, uh, the mercenary armies, uh, the, the dope sellers and the, and the Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, who you know not only was running a nationalist army, but was also uh, deeply involved in in the in the opium trade, and and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just the way it was back then. But uh, going from from there to to running that money uh, secretly out of the Golden Triangle into uh, a bank, you know, to wash it. Well, Frank Nugent and Michael Hand uh, started a CIA bank called the Nugent Hand. Nugent Hand, yeah. And and when Frank Nugent uh, ended up in his uh, Mercedes Benz limousine with a, a shotgun next to his 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 arm and and a and a hole in his head, um, one morning when the police discovered it, uh, that was the end, I think, of of the Gal Whitlam. Uh, uh, regime in Australia, which had been a democratically elected, uh, and they they would have investigated and they would have found out what happened since that. It was brought time, down, that, that government was brought down by an intervention of the Queen. Okay. Tell us a little yeah. bit more about that, because that, that's where I think that this whole thing with Australia started, is that, you know, that was that was the end of Australian sovereignty right there when when uh, Frank Nugent got, got uh, suicided. Um, from then to now, you know, what have they done? They've taken away the guns, right? They, they all threw all their guns into a big gun pile and, and, and smashed them up. So now what are they going to do? Uh, the people of Australia, uh, only thing I, I, I ever see that I see a lot of hope in the people of France and the Netherlands and Italy and Spain, because you see them, I see them on Twitter. People have, have posted uh, videos of them out there and there are thousands and thousands protesting uh, the uh, the proposed uh, or the existing uh, passports uh, based on on a, on a vaccine status, and and this this is something we don't have in America. We we don't have a consensus of people that are going to get out on the streets uh, and say, you know, no government, you can't do that. You are failing the people, and you work for us. That seems to be a stronger spirit in Europe now than in America, where in America, it, the, the answer you're likely to get is, you know, uh, you know, over my dead body, you, you know, I'm because I'm, we still got our guns. Not me. I don't have a gun, but 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 uh, <laughs> generally our population is armed to the teeth. So the government does have uh, that. Well, but, let me say something about the, the situation in Europe, because you're, you're right to a certain extent, but I think it also shows the problem of how the, the uh, pandemic crisis is being used to channel people in one direction. 
Okay. Because here's the point. The biggest problem in Europe is the European Union. It's that these nations have no sovereignty, mm -hmm. that their policies are dictated by globalist corporations and banks operating out of Brussels, out of uh, Strasbourg, out of especially London and Frankfurt. They make all the decisions. And so if the Italians, for example, when there was an earthquake in Italy a couple of years ago, and the government, which had a, a problem with its budget deficit, wanted to extend credit to rebuild the power stations, the European Union turned them down and said, you can't get credit for that because you've already spent too much money. And they said, but this is our country. Why can't we issue a bond offering and raise money to do it? Because it violates the Maastricht Agreement. And so now what's interesting is that with this situation with Australia and, and Britain and the United States against France, the French press is raising the question of what would de Gaulle have done? And of course, the answer is de Gaulle left NATO. De Gaulle wasn't willing to leave French security in the hands of London and Washington. And so they developed the force de frappe, the independent French nuclear force. And what happened to de Gaulle? 20 something assassination attempts against him. They eventually used a, a regime change based on a student rebellion in 1968 to get rid of him. But de Gaulle would never have gone along with the European Union. His idea was that you have to have an alliance, the European Union should be an alliance of sovereign nation states that work together in multilateral agreements but not a single government that dictates to all the individual countries. So what my colleagues in, in France, and I have a friend, Jacques Cheminard, who's very prominent in France. He's, a, he's run for president a few times. He's sort of Lyndon LaRouche's man in France. Jacques issued a statement after Le Drian, the French foreign minister said, this is a stab in the back and the French were all uh, up in arms with Gallic outrage about the, the uh, secret agreement of the US, UK, and Australia. And Jacques said, look, don't, don't complain. Let's reassert sovereignty. Let's just say we're not going to go along with the Atlanticist policies. We're not going to go along with the anti-China policy, the anti-Russia policy. We're not going to go along with the single union policy. And if you had the outrage that you see in the streets in France over the passport issue, if you'd see that mobilized toward a broader French national context to fight against the, the way in which the, the, they're using the anger of the population, actually against the population, they may end up getting rid of the passports. Then what happens? Well, they're still under the EU, under the European Union. So, you know, we're telling the people in Europe, our message is we've got to junk the Green New Deal and the Great Reset and junk this idea of a European defense alliance. Because what they're saying now is, well, maybe we shouldn't stay in NATO. Let's set up our own common European defense. That'll never work. I, I'm sure you remember in the Kinzer book, that was what John Foster Dulles was pushing in the 19, late 40s, early 50s, a European common defense. And NATO was an, an, an attempt to create a, a something outside of Europe with the US playing a major role. But now they're talking about you know, a European common defense. They can't even raise the money to build planes in, in Britain right now. The, the German army, and LaRouche used to joke, the soldiers lose the war with the cigarette butts when they police the parade grounds. So, and then what's the whole point of a European defense right now? To kick the Russians out of Crimea? Well, don't you believe in democracy? The people of Crimea voted over 85% to unite with Russia. You're going to try and conquer Crimea and take it back into Ukraine? That's going to be the common purpose? with the, the likelihood being that the Russians would overrun all of Ukraine if you sent an army in to do that in Crimea. So this is where you see the, the, the insanity in the big picture, John. I, I don't know if you saw my update yesterday, but I basically said, we've got to fight against this insane ideological umbrella that covers the whole Western world. 
the Green New Deal is part of it. The Great Reset is part of it. Uh, challenging Russia and China uh, is part of it. it. It makes very little sense. My uh, my colleague David Underdown has been doing some great research, and and he pointed out something that I guess I I, I hadn't put two and two together. But did you know that Henry Kissinger and Reinhard Galen were at Camp King at the same time in 1946? Um, Camp King I didn't know that, and and that's how NATO. Na Galen was part of founding of NATO. Well, Galen was was basically recruited by John or Alan Dulles, yeah, uh, to take his Nazi stay behind networks and turn them into part of the so called anti communist forces that became the core of NATO. But but what the real mission was, in my my humble opinion, was Gladio. Yeah. Was, was creating these so-called stay behind armies, but what they really are, are, are enforcement techniques for the consolidation of total power in a uh, European Union. Yeah. Um, so, so that it's not, you know, it sounds like, yeah, we're fighting Russia, you know, it's the enemy outside, but you know, <laughs> well, what it really is, is, is um, making sure that you keep your your control. The elites that have the money now are, are never going to lose it as long as they can control the population. And and that's that's uh, well, <laughs> having the, these hidden armies with arms caches all over Europe that are controlled by uh, the elites of the of the pre-war period in, ensures that they don't lose their power. I mean, look at look at Prince Bernard and the Bilderbergers and all of these guys. How do they sustain their power? Ultimately, it's not just with money. Um, I think there's there's a lot of connections between NATO and the old uh, imperial uh, powers of Europe that are you know and work through work through people like Klaus Schwab. You know, yeah. Uh, I, I was fascinated studying Klaus Schwab. You know, he came from uh, Ravensburg or or Ravensburg mm -hmm. in English, which is Ravens, yeah. which is always significant uh, to us Poe fans. But but <laughs> Raven, Ravensburg. Um, is where the Welfs started. The, the Welfs being the uh, imperial side of the Welfs and Ghibellines. It, it, we get these Italian names, but they're really Germans. And, and that, uh, to me, just speaks volumes that, that here's this guy who's basically, his roots, his entire, his genetic makeup comes from an imperial attitude of, you know, there's the, the the ones that run society and then there's the serfs. Yeah. And we've all been classed as serfs. And 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 that's why a Boris Johnson will just walk away from a from a, a very important question and just say, well, I've got to get on a jet and go to New York. Because he doesn't really care what we think. We're serfs. You know, another example of that is Ursula von der Leyen, who's the president of the European Commission whose family is a, a minor nobility family. I think it's the uh, Albrecht family or Ulbrecht. Uh, look at Prince Philip, uh, the late Prince Philip. His, yeah. his uh, family members were all loyal to Hitler. Uh, you, one of the key networks in Germany is the Turn and Toxis family in, uh, uh, what city is that? It, it, Regensburg. And the Turn and Toxis family, this is where the name taxi comes from. They had the right to distribute the mail for the Holy Roman Empire, which meant they always knew what, who was going to fight whom, what was going on. And this is a, a family that uh, still to this day is quite important. Uh, this is in the Bavarian nobility. So you, you're absolutely right. You look at the, the, the fights going on in Europe, and what you find is these networks that were some of them supported the communists, some of them supported the Nazis in the 20s. They were interchangeable, the, the banking families. And who is there coordinating it? There's people like the Dulles brothers, people like Montague Norman, the head of the Bank of England, who played a very big role in the rise of Hitler. Uh, Hitler's finance minister, Schacht, was essentially an operative of the Bank of England. He's the one who put together the concentration camp as work camps. Before they started gassing people, they were working people to death. 
slave labor, cheap labor. And who are they working these people to death for? Krupp, Farben, you know, the war machine. Yeah. So this is when you look at the Great Reset today, we're looking at the same kind of phenomena. Exactly. Only now they're more sophisticated. They pretend that they're liberals, that they're worried about the environment. They're worried about budget deficits and the effect that has on the normal person. They don't give a damn about what happens to the normal person. They never have. As you point out, they, they see the normal person as a, as a slave or someone who needs to be culled if they can think for themselves. Yes, and, and that, that brings me back to a, a, a point I think I'll try to make here, that there, we, have, we have generally tried to approach educating the public as to these issues in a sense of logic, of saying, look, look what Biden is doing. It doesn't make any sense. We shouldn't be doing this. But that doesn't help. The, the, the people that have already decided, you know, Biden, I'm riding with Biden. Well, they're, they're not going to get off the Biden train just because you told them that something that he did doesn't make sense. Because they can say, well, well, maybe that doesn't make sense, but Trump did 100 things that didn't make sense, so I'm staying with Biden. It's right, simple. Simple logic. So the other, point, the other approach, which we shy away from, is calling them out on being an intentional yeah. evil to say this this is not negligence this this is not biden's not stupid okay he's doing this because the people that pull the strings behind biden have a policy that needs him to do this and what is that policy that is driving biden to do something that's illogical and who benefits ultimately when we figure out what this policy is somehow we've got to convince people that not only does evil exist but it exists in the minds of our highest government officials that it that that it is the motivating factor is depopulation the motivating factor is control of the serfs that's where I think we have to go if we're going to change the debate. See, and, and a lot of this is that you have people who are have become morally indifferent. You know, they'll say something like, well, we can't do anything for Afghanistan anyway. We can't do anything for the people who are starving in parts of Africa. Yeah. Uh, we can't do anything with people who are failing in the inner city schools. And so you have an attitude of, of indifference, but at the top, it's not indifference. In some cases, it's people become indifferent because they're on a career pathway. They're pursuing a career. This is how the military industrial complex works. Now, we had a, a really interesting talk on our, our Saturday Manhattan Project program this week. Uh, I was on to, to go through some of these things. We had a someone who's a columnist for something called the UK Column, uh, Mike Robinson, who's been studying the question of how the British manipulate policy for a long time. He's one of the people who put forward the whole picture of that, how the BBC was running the Integrity Initiative and Bellingcat and these so-called public, public sourcing investigators who really were coming out of MI6. Mike is one of the people who investigated that. And, and he dug into this thing called public diplomacy, the public diplomacy arm of the British government. And what they talk about is hard power, which is military kinetic might, but more importantly now is soft power, which includes cyber technologies, but also includes what they used to call brainwashing. And what they're saying is the Chinese are better at that than we are. And one of the examples they give is that the Chinese are cracking down on the use of video games for, for youth and that the Chinese are, going, are doing this to brainwash the people to become Chinese nationalists and militaristic aggressors and so on. Well, the Chinese government is clear they're, they're cracking down on video games because their young people are falling behind for the first time recently in, in science work. And the Chinese are committed to constantly uplifting 
the population through scientific, scientific, scientific work. So, so this is an interesting thing because this is then played back into the United States. See, they're taking away the freedoms. In the U.S., children are free to play video games 24 hours a day if they want to, if their parents will let them. Um, in the U.S., we let people use drugs if they want to, including uh, dangerous drugs. The, the move toward decriminalizing virtually everything is underway. So we're in a situation where morality is, is being thrown out the window. And it's this is what the public diplomacy arm of British intelligence is about. And this is where people like George Orwell and the Huxley brothers worked uh, on how to convince people to do things that go against their interests happily. That's the ultimate policy, the way this thing works. Yeah, you start. You said it right at the beginning. Moral, uh, moral indifference, or um, the, the the older phrase was, uh, what did the conservatives used to used to say? Uh, um, uh, relativity, moral relativism, relativism, moral relativism. Moral relativism. Yeah. yeah, and and that's that's a sin, you know. You you don't don't apply, you know. Well, there's I, nothing universal. That's what they basically say. There are no universal principles. Yeah. And and what you real what they're really saying is there's no God. Exactly. There's they're saying there's you know, life is just what you make of it. Uh, do what thou wilt, you know. To quote Alistair however many letters he has Crowley. in his first name, Crowley, Alice D. Ayer, who added a letter to make it 13. <laughs> um, that that guy, you know, with the, the pyramid head and everything and the, the big eye, uh, he's a great symbol for for the incredible circus that they're putting on. Look, it, it's the, what, what people my age came up through with the rock, sex, drug counterculture. Do your own thing. There's, there's no higher imperative than your own personal pleasure. And if yeah. you look back in history, where does this come from? This is Jeremy Bentham's philosophic or philosophic calculus that it's your own, the, the greatest pleasure to the greatest number of people. That's what's right. Uh -huh. And pleasure is not in the Bentham's calculus does not come from seeing a child discover a universal principle like squaring the circle or doubling the cube. It comes from something that gives them physical pleasure or emotional pleasure. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get people to give up critical thinking to just get something that brings them a, a momentary pleasure, then it's very easy to manipulate them and, and look at the sports and entertainment society we live in. Uh, you know, of, of all the things Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has done, which are uh, objectionable, wearing a fancy dress saying tax the rich to the Met Gala is probably one of the, the least important things. And yet that's what everyone's getting focused on. You can easily manipulate people around these kinds of things. So this is where the, the ideologies uh, the, the ideological profiles are used to get people to put out all the emotional energy uh, into these momentary battles that ultimately don't amount to much. You know what it is? That, what was it? The 32nd hate that in Orwell's uh, 1984, the five minute hate where they all got together and screamed about the, how bad the enemy is. I don't remember that. I got I I, yeah, there, there were the daily demonstrations where you, you got out and, and screamed <laughs> your head off about how bad this guy Goldstein was. Perfect. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a great example. Um, and just to articulate my own view of what you just said, yeah, I'm looking at uh, AOC, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who is uh, obviously an over-the-shoulder um uh, Pin up girl type of pose, uh, yeah. you know, emphasizing the the the, the, the posterior uh, and 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 her, you know, she has a physique that's very very attractive to uh, to young males uh, and other it's a Kardashian people. type thing, 
but yeah, and so so she gets your attention, and then she puts her message on there, which is tax the rich, and you say, oh, I want to tax the rich, and something something magic happens in your brain because you've got this happy happy feeling that you're looking at this almost goddess like creature, and she is reinforcing your very own thoughts, you know. Or if you're conservative. I, I, John, huh? if you're a conservative, yeah. you get angry because you say this liberal is trying to take away the chance that I might get rich. Okay, okay, and uh, yeah, thirty thousand dollars a ticket. But that, I mean, to me, that's nothing. It's it's the uh, the whole production. She must have put hundred thousand or more into just producing her appearance. Just that little walk down the down towards the stairs. There, probably you know, hundred thousand dollars worth of of effort went into doing it just exactly right for the cameras. And you and, polarize, you polarize around slogans or uh, simple things, simple issues that mask the complexities that are really there. And you know, at this point, what, what, um, what we're doing, what the Schiller Institute is doing is, is we're essentially saying we have to end this idea of geopolitics, the idea that there are enemies that we have to fight. And we have to end the idea that we're the unilateral power because we have bigger and better nuclear weapons, because we may not have bigger and better nuclear weapons in the near future. And that's where this whole Thucydides trap comes in. Are we about to be overtaken by the Chinese and the Russians? And since the end of the Second World War, that's been the, the issue that's been played repeatedly to manipulate the, the U.S. population. And it started to break down because of the overplaying their hand with Russiagate. I, I wanted to just mention one other thing, which was that we finally saw what happened to uh, Where's Waldo, the prosecutor from Connecticut. He okay. finally came out with an indictment. Yeah. This is actually a fairly significant indictment, this lawyer Michael Sussman from the Perkins Coy Law Firm, who was instrumental in pulling together the lie that went into the FBI investigation into Trump and Russia that became Russiagate. So finally, at the, the last minute, uh, we get this one indictment. Now, how far is this going to go? If you put this together with possibly declassifying the 9-11 documents and then finally publicly declassifying the Russiagate documents, maybe you can begin to get at who actually is pulling the strings of the, the so-called deep state. So I think the fact that Durham finally did get this grand jury indictment is quite significant. And I, I think I did a, a thing the other day. Uh, uh, do you now believe there was a coup? I mean, the, the, the story of, uh, again, General Milley, this Durham indictment, it all makes clear there was a coup attempted after the election of Donald Trump. And the people who ran the coup are still in the wings watching to make sure they keep control over everything. And that's one of the, the points we have to make, that it's not a conspiracy theory. There really was a coup plot. Yes, and it's still going on in a way. Um, he still doesn't have a Twitter page, you know. Um, well, and it's also if Biden does something that's that's right, you know, for example, declassifying the nine eleven documents, they they make that make light of that. If he pulls troops out of Afghanistan, even if it's done poorly, uh, you find that the military is trying to stop it. So, you know, these things are still very much with us. And the idea that they're, they're trying to do is to control the administration, make sure that it doesn't get out of uh, control. You know, in the case of Biden, it's hard to imagine him doing something that would really break with the deep state, but you never know. Well, I'm... I'm going to uh, give you a, a kind of a cynical, but actually what I think is actually a realistic uh, scenario from, from the Sussman indictment. Because first of all, let's, let's significant, as you said, last minute, it was a last minute as it was reported in the paper that it was on the last day 
before the statute of limitations for that particular crime would have run right. out. Exactly. Well, let's go back and look at some of the history that, that we've been studying, especially with George, uh, George Webb following the Mike Flynn and the B. John Keon and, and, uh, and, and Judge Emmett Sullivan and, uh, you know, Sidney Powell and all, all of this stuff. I've, I've been going around uh, to courtrooms watching this with, with, with George and, and it's been uh, a, a, an education in how they cover things up. Because, uh, and George's phrase is slap and seal. They'll take this guy, Sussman. They'll give him a plea to, it'll, it'll take a while. It'll drag out, you know, but then there, ultimately there'll be a plea. And uh, as part of the plea, you know, the, the evidence that the prosecution has it's buried. will be sealed. Yeah. And the judge will sign off on this uh, seal. And so it's called a slap and seal. And, and, and the effect of that is that Sussman, by taking that little dive, has protected all the bigger fish that are above him in, the, in, in, in that cesspool of, of corruption that, that started Russiagate. So is this a way to kind of pull the wool over our eyes once again? Of course. You know, we, we're, don't worry, folks, you know, Durham's on the case. He's, he's prosecuted. He's slow. You know, he's slow, but he's methodical. You know, he's, he's going to get him. He's going to get him. You know, one of these days he's going to get him. He's not going to get him. My prediction is that it's going to be a slap and seal and that the American people are going to just forget about it. Just like every year, Charlie Brown forgets that Lucy's going to pull the football out. <laughs> Well, you're right, that's a little cynical, but it's certainly not untrue. The question is, can we do something to change that? Can we use the, the evidence that, that keeps coming out? Yeah. Uh, can we keep people focused long enough on the evidence so they don't forget that Sussman was a bit player in this whole thing and that the strings were being pulled behind the scenes by Hillary and Podesta and people like that but that their strings were also being pulled. And that's, that's where we have to get people. Yes, and that's exactly why I, I point that out, because it's not just cynical anymore. It's also realistic, because this does happen, and it may, it may very well happen in this case. And to see Russiagate all just flush down the toilet with a slap and seal would be a, a horrible, horrible crime, you know, for the 80-some million people that supported President Trump. And, and and he was robbed of his of his ability to govern, uh, yeah. just as as so many other presidents have by this scandal or that scandal. Uh, so yeah, I think that that by pointing it out, by shining a light on this keep idea, the drum. We've got to do that. We've got to keep this in front of people that what you think is real is not real. You're being played. That's right. And once and people hate to be played. You know. Yeah. I, 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 I think that is what they're really afraid of, is that when we somebody finally pulls back the curtain and the man behind the curtain is standing there and saying, please don't pay attention to me yeah. <laughs> the guy behind the curtain. You know, so, uh oh. All right. So uh, Toto's going to win in the end. We're quite sure here at uh, McDuff Channel. And thanks again, Harley, for your uh, great insight and thoughts and, and your writing. And, uh, and uh, just keep up the good work. Uh, and best, best wishes for your wife's recovery. Thank you so much, Harley. Uh, I will tell her you said that. And uh, David Underdown is in the chat room putting up a whole lot of interesting drops. So, folks, don't, don't forget to look at the chat after the show. Bye now.